Okay, so wait. All right, so we, we continue. If there are no questions, then we, we continue with the uh, This is sad, right? <laughs> you call home and tell them <laughs> at Unza we have the way we switch off the lights is. <laughs> it's a sad, sad, sad place, right? What can we do to change things? What can we do? All right, so we, we continue our discussion. Um, so we're trying to finish off, we're trying to finish off uh, this so-called uh, MIPS, MIPS instruction set. Uh, I, I guess we've, we've gotten to a stage where we understand, we understand the whole point of this instruction set, right? Um, so typically, um, any 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 sort of like computer system hardware will have an associated instruction set, right? And the instruction set um, signals to potential programmers um, on what exactly it is they can do with a computer system by way of instructing it on what it should do, right? So the the core instruction set uh, more or less like building blocks that help you. Um, uh, come up with more complex software programs or software applications, right? Uh, so before we start here, just a reminder, tomorrow and day after tomorrow, we are going to meet in there. Um, the reason we're doing this, by the way, is uh, I'm worried that we might not, we might not be able to cover some of these things with Nondi by the time we are writing the test, which is why we decided to combine, for us to have like some sort of hands-on sessions, Wednesdays or Fridays or something where we get to practice. Uh, and then this thing is due to uh, tomorrow at 02.30 because it was uploaded two hours late, so. Um, and then the test, take note again, right? Right, so, I mean, to wrap up, what we're gonna do is just walk, walk through these different things, I can't see. Um, All right, uh, so we know now, after doing our very comprehensive research, uh, the fundamental differences between RISC and CISC, right? Um, I mean, this is by no means comprehensive, but I just thought I'd give you a rundown of some of the things that we already know. Um, you know, we're focusing more on RISC because MIPS is a RISC-based architecture. Uh, you know, things or traits, characteristics, like fewer instructions associated with um, this particular philosophy, fixed format typically, right? Um, because the, the instructions of a fixed format, efficiency, right? They're more efficient. Um, so it's much faster to execute instructions that are associated with this, right? And of course, it's much faster for you to decode because they're not as complex as instructions associated with uh, sys-based architectures. Um, because of all of this, obviously, the circuitry that you get to work with is much much simpler. But there's a drawback, right? Because you're working with a fixed instruction set, 
problem arises when you want to perform complex things. Right? It turns out that um, ah, what people have done is they've come up with um, what we are calling pseudo instructions. Right? So instructions that are derived from the core instruction set associated with whatever recipe-based architecture you might be looking at that do um, much more than what that core instruction set can do. And we've already seen examples of this, right? Move, for instance. Load instruction. And we'll see uh, a few other examples like, you know, unconditional branches, for instance, right? But, but the bottom line here is because you're working with a fixed set of instructions, and because you might be wanting to do other things other than what can be allowed by that fixed instruction set, what you do is you come up with pseudo instructions, derived instructions, right? And the, the, the pseudo instructions would obviously have to be converted into a form that the CPU is going to be able to understand. Because ultimately this so-called instruction set is more or less like um, operations that your CPU can perform. What we're saying is a risk-based architecture the CPU associated with the risk-based architecture cannot, does not know what move is. Because move is a pseudo-instruction. So what ultimately has to, to happen is this has to be converted into its equivalent bare instruction that the CPU will be able to execute. Right, so really the difference between pseudo-instruction and bare instruction is obviously intuitive. Bare instructions are action instructions executed by the CPU or read instructions that make up the core instruction set of that particular architecture. And then pseudo instructions would be derived instructions from the bare instruction. Right. Um, so something else that has come up a lot and I've pointed at, at this is the fact that when, when you make use of uh, pseudo instructions like load immediate or move, you notice that Qt spin, for instance, in this case, will show you the equivalent bare instruction that the CPU is going to execute. Right, so this is a source code that uh, um, you know, a programmer would probably come up with, and you notice line number, number five in this case is converted into uh, add um, unassigned, right? So there's no move instruction. There's no move bare instruction. This has to be converted into a form that the CPU will be able to recognize and execute. Uh, same goes for load immediate. There's no load immediate instruction. This must be converted to a bare instruction that the CPU is going to execute. Right, and, and, and so obviously, I mean, uh, one would argue that sure, I mean, the, 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 the core, the instructions that form the core instruction set might be efficient, but once you, you, you start playing around with pseudo instructions, you, you end up creating like some sort of drawback because this has to be converted into a form that the CPU will be able to understand, right? Um, time is involved there. Uh, sit down here. In case you are curious, I mean, there's a whole bunch of pseudo instructions out there. So move and, uh, and, um, and load immediate are by no means the only ones. I thought I would, I would, I would kind of include some of the things that we've touched on. There is no DIV operation that takes in three, um, three operands or three registers. There's no such thing. There's no such thing, right? Sorry. Which is why, um, well, which is why what typically happens is if you execute if, if you assemble your div operation that takes in three registers, what will happen is QTSPIM will show you the equivalent div operation that has just two arguments. But behind the scenes, obviously, what, uh, what's happening is uh, this DIV operation with three registers um, will be converted into two separate instructions. The original DIV um, instruction that takes in two, two registers and an additional instruction that is going to move the result. Because you're interested in the quotient when you're dividing, so move the result from the uh, low register, which is why um, for you to, for the CPU, the CPU will actually uh, execute two separate instructions. When you use the DIV uh, instruction that takes in three registers. The same goes for mod. 
there is no MUL operation that takes in three registers. No such thing, right? Behind the scenes, what the CPU does is it executes the, the mode operation and the uh, move from law here, not MO, M, M, F4, right? So uh, get the point here. I mean, other things that are there, like un unconditional branching, uh, things like uh, branch if greater than, there's no such thing as branch if greater than. In actual fact, behind the scenes, what you're doing is you're making use of the branch if not equal. Right, so this is pseudo instruction, uh, pseudo instruction. Right, uh, I, I, pseudo instruction is pretty intuitive and pretty easy here, right? And the only thing we need to take into account here is the uh, fundamental differences between uh, so called bare instructions and pseudo instructions, and perhaps be able to, to cite or give examples of, uh, of the two. And why why it's desirable to have one over the other or something? All right. So next up is uh, this so-called instructions for deci decision making. You notice that we are we've got into a stage now where we are saying, sure, we understand that we have these these uh, um, individual instructions that form the core instruction instruction set and, and and perhaps pseudo instructions as well. But then how do we go about? Um, implementing complex applications that do much more than just add two integers, for instance. Because that's what we're interested in, right? This is what happens when we're using a computer like this one, right? It's, it's not like you're, you're, you'd be interested in a, a piece of software that just adds or subtracts two integers. You want it to do much more than that. So the question is, how do we do that, right? It turns out that there are fundamental building blocks. Um, this is what we're looking at here, trying to understand exactly how these are implemented. Um, by the machine. Uh, so first up is uh, instructions for decision making. This is, this is uh, something you do over and over again when you're writing software, right? Uh, depending on depending on an action that might be performed, you might want to execute a particular piece of code, or you might want to not execute a particular piece of code. And the, the only example I can think of here is that small little Python program that I created where we were wanting to uh, print whether someone passed or failed. Right? You're making a decision based on whether the input coming from a user is going to be less than 22.5 or if it's going to be greater than or equal to 22.5. That is a decision you're making. Right? So you, you have to write a series of instructions for doing that. Right? Uh, it turns out that uh, uh, MIPS has a, and listen guys, there's a whole range of examples we can think about here, right? It's not just, a, um, well, it could be age, how old are you? You know, if you're less than a particular age, you can't be enrolled into grade one or something. They used to do that back in the day, you know. Um, uh, if you enter your password in a text box and the password is wrong, then you won't be, you won't log in, right? Classic example of a practical application of, I guess maybe, I don't know if you do that, but practical example of a piece of software that does much more using decision making. Enter a password. Password is wrong, right? You won't log in. Enter a password, correct password, you log in, right? You're making a decision. So fundamentally what we're saying behind the scenes, you actually get to do these you know, primitive things here. It turns out that MIPS actually has a whole range of instructions that you use for branching. Um, there's a pseudo instruction B. This is like, it's called an unconditional branch because what you do is you branch without any condition. So you, write, you just write an instruction say branch. You just, whatever, whatever happens irrespective of uh, an outcome, you branch to a specified label. Right, so you'd have, uh, you'd have uh, uh, I guess, instruction one, instruction two, uh, branch, instruction three, uh, I guess. W what happens with unconditional branching is you execute the instructions one at a time. Once you get here, um, what you do is you, you branch, irrespective of what has happened there, just branch. You go to X, it's like you saying go to X, right? And then you uh, jump this instruction, so you won't execute this instruction, and then just go direct to X, which is a label, 
We'll look at examples just now. Right. Uh, and I want us to think about scenarios where we would use one over the other, right? When, when can we use an unconditional branch? I don't know. Um, there's also branch, you know, branch, branch if equal, which is BEQ. Um, this is a syntax here uh, where you, you are essentially checking to see if the contents of this register and this register are the same. If they're the same, so branch when equal, if they're the same, you shall branch to the label. So you, you will go to that label. If the values are not the same, you will not execute. You know, it's, it's like, it's like you're going to uh, continue executing the piece of program sequentially. So you execute the next instruction that follows this statement here. You notice it's logic, right? Branch when not equal, like the opposite of that. Um, you're checking if the values that are held by these two registers are not the same. If they're not the same, then you shall branch. If they are the same, you do not branch. Do you understand this? Making sense? Um, and then also you can, like I said, you can make use of uh, so-called uh, pseudo instructions like br branch if less than, so you're essentially just checking to see if uh, the, the value in here is less than the value in there. Yes, and then you jump. The label would be, I do hope we have examples. The label would be instructions that you create. Remember when we, we, we said, uh, oh, when you're writing, right, when, when you're writing a piece of program, we, we normally have this, right? Somewhere, main label. And our pieces of uh, code have been so primitive, we only have one label, but you can have multiple labels. For instance, you could say, I am going to, the same example we had where we are com comparing two values, right? You will have a label that says uh, pass, and a label that says fail. So what you could do is you put instructions here that are going to, um, instructions that are going to be associated with someone having a value that enables them to pass. Instructions associated with someone failing, right? Um, so you notice that in here, what you would do is you would have like a branch if echo, for instance, uh, let's say, uh, and this is, this is, this is bad. Okay, branch if echo. Um, uh, I've given a very bad example here. But let's say we are, we're just checking to see if someone has gotten, uh, has just gotten uh, a value that is equal to 22.5. We're just trying to check those that have gotten 22.5, right? Uh, the value that you'd have in nine is perhaps they had coded 22.5, that's 22.5, and the value in eight is like a, an input that you're getting from the user, they will just type in an input, yeah? So it will check, if someone types in, say, I got 20, for instance, you know that 20 is not equal to 22.5, so this will not execute, but if someone enters 22.5, then you know that 22.5 is going to be equal to 22.5, right? Branch if equal, 22.5, 22.5, they are equal, right? Branch, you will go to pass. Meaning that, in path, you must have instructions that you'd want to execute associated with someone passing. So perhaps it would be like, just print, uh, just print uh, the string saying, you passed, or something. Now I'm simplifying things here, this is not how you write them, right? You passed. Yeah. So what you have in the label is instructions, similar to the instructions that you put in main, only the instructions will be executed depending on whether the condition has been satisfied. Yes. Is there like, um, since you're saying 
22.5 millimeters fast than less than that of yours. So is that is there a register that carries what you want it to be equal or not equal to? No. Another register? So it's you, it's your you job. Think, how is, so I'm just going to how like how am I going to on the computer that I want to find out who got less than 22.5? You, you, you're writing the instructions. You would have to write the instruction. Yes, so, like me, like, so, so, so bef maybe let's do this. Okay, let's, maybe in case people are not, I know some people, I, I don't know if people understand. Is there anyone who doesn't understand what we're saying here? Uh, that's not true. If you, there's no stalling here. You know, it's, uh, we shall do this even if it means making up. We have to do everything. Okay, so let's, here's the thing, right? You know, there's some people, who, uh, I've interacted with some people who say, no, we don't understand thinking that uh, the lecture will stop and then, no. Uh, well, <laughs> we shall do this. Here's the thing, right? Um, branch example one. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Program, illustrating, branching, right? So let's let's say we are writing a program program to check if um, if if value equals in two point five. Same example. Same drill, right? These are this is this has become second nature to us now, right? This is stuff that um, we understand now. What we're saying is, you, you're interested in implementing a program that's going to check if a value is equal to twenty-two point five. So you already you already have you already have the number that you're going to be comparing against. The first thing you need to do is obviously load this number somewhere, right? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to load 22.5 into register eight, right, as a starting point. And then because I'm interested in checking. That's in min. Yes, it's in min. But because I'm interested in checking whatever random value someone is going to use with this, I need to, I need to, um, account for that random number, right? Uh, and we can, we can do different things. We can prompt the user to enter it, but we'll simplify things. Let's just say we'll hard code it again. Let's assume this is value entered by user, right? And then we'll just assume the user has entered 30. We're just assuming the user has entered 30. The way branch, if equal, works is we are saying BQ, that's instruction, it's predefined, branch if equal, it takes in three arguments, right? Registers you are comparing against. You are going to branch if, in this case, if the value in eight and in nine are equal, I'm gonna tell this piece of program to say, branch to, let's say, uh, I'll call this equal label or something. What the program, what, what, what the computer is going to expect when it sees, because once this thing is assembled, there's some, some symbol table that's going to be created somewhere, and then you know this will probably have an equivalent address in memory, right? A label is just an address in memory, it's a placeholder, right? So what this means is that I must have a label somewhere in my source code here that is going to spell out exactly what must be done if these two numbers are equal, right? Uh, so I must have an equal label, like so. And uh, an equal label is the same as main, right? A label is followed by a full column. And in this, in this equal label, I'm, we're just going to, to do a simple thing. We shall print. Because we want to print, I need some string somewhere up there. Uh, uh, 
and just for simplicity, uh, uh, simplicity sake, I'll just say the string is going to be values are equal. So what we're saying is, in here, in, e in e equal label, what we wish to do is if the two numbers are equal, we wish to just print to the console to say equal, values are equal, right? And, and we know the drill in here, we will just say, uh, how do we print? V0, 4, right? Cisco, but up here we need to load the address of, um, of the stream, right? By equals. Do you understand this? What I'm doing from line number 15 is something that must be done, by the way, and I'll explain just now. 14 and 15. But observe what happens. If I open up Qt spin and assemble and, and run this program, um, thank you very much. I mean, uh, uh, why, why am I, we just assume it's 22. We're working with integers here, not floats and doubles, right? <clears throat> so we just assume it's 22, not 22.5. Do you understand why we had this error? We're, we're, we're not working with coprocessor one, we're just looking at integers, we're simplifying things here, right? It just doesn't change a thing here. So if I run this, right, you'll notice that because the values I just entered are not the same, they, there's nothing that's printed on the console here. But if I, if I change this nine to 22, and execute this, oh, Lord initialize. Yeah? Conditional branching. You only get to, you are, you are, you are performing, you are performing, you are selectively performing operations based on whether or not a particular condition is satisfied. This is what we're saying. And really, if you look at this, what you can do here is do fancy things like, ah, oh, well, fine, if I have this condition, then maybe I might be interested in having another condition, a branch if not equal, right? To say, if they're equal, I'm gonna branch here, but what if they're not equal, what do I do? You have a B and Q, right? So it's just a logic. Just need to understand how you use the instruction for branching. The rest is just, you know, logic. How do you go about implementing what needs to be done when the two values are equal? Is this making sense now? Yes, sir. Right, so this is important. Uh, his question is, and I forgot, this question is why do we have line number 14 and 15? It turns out that if you don't, if you don't put line number 14 and 15, it's logic, you, you run into a, a, a logical error, right, a logic error, because what, what the CPU will do is, it will execute everything. Irrespective of what the condition is. Observe, right now, what will happen is once you get to line number 12, it will check if what is in eight and nine is the same. Are they the same? Yes. If they're the same, it's going to jump and execute here, which is fine. But if they're not the same, what it will do is it will continue execution. Now if the values are not the same and we don't tell the program to say this is where the main label ends, then what will happen is it will execute everything including the things that are in the equals label. So it's, it's like it defeats the whole point of you having this label in the first place. Observe what happens if I remove the labels, right? Um, if I say remove the, uh, sorry, not the labels, remove this aggressive uh, execution out of men, and uh, put 13 here. What we expect is, we, we don't expect a string to be, logically we wouldn't expect the string um, values are equal to be printed now, would we? But, but if we execute this piece of program right now, what will happen is, and this is where we pray to the gods, say this is going to happen. What will happen is, there we go, comes here. 
Sorry? Yeah, because it's a logical error, right? We've, we've made a mistake. It's, it's, it's like someone enters the wrong password and they log in, right? It's, it's a logical error. <laughs> yeah, but this is what happens, right? If you don't take these things into account, they'll log in with whatever password. So do you understand why what we're saying is always get into the habit of gracefully exiting out of the main label and these other labels, actually. Because it turns out that your your piece of code might have much more than what you have here, right? It could have like maybe a thousand or a hundred lines of instructions here. So depending on whatever whatever instructions you're executing in different labels, you want to make sure that they're self-contained. And the way they, the way that you specify to the CPU to say this is where this ends is you use system call code number 10, which is why we had it in line number 14 and 15. Is this making sense now? People always make that mistake, right? I don't know. Um, press for exit out of here. <coughs> Sorry? In fact, we should. Thank you for that. You, you, you see, the, the, because we, we didn't, what we, what we have is uh, that runtime error where that, that, that irritating message pops up once we execute the instructions in the label. I have to load and initialize this, I guess. And it didn't come up here because these are different. But if they're the same, observe. If the values are the same and we execute this, the, the string will be printed out quite all right, but this thing comes up. Yeah, because we, we haven't gracefully exited out of the label here, which is why <coughs> Madame there was saying, uh, let's do this as well in here, which is what we should do. So if you run this now, it's error is gone. Do you understand this? Okay, that's not hard now, is it? Now, now, so already you can, you, 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 you already, I'm, I'm guessing you're already coming up with ideas on how you can, you know, make use of these different um, instructions for branching, right? Uh, it'd be interesting if people can tell us what they could use in conditional branch for. Right, so, I mean, just saying that uh, some, some syntax for the different instructions, the showcasing something similar to what we just did here. This is how we go about using the unconditional branch. The conditional branch is B instruction followed by the label where you're branching to. And if you're the one implementing this program, you must make sure that there is a label that exists in your program. There must be a label where you're branching to, right? Um, again, just an example of an unconditional branch here. Uh, what this means, by the way, is that if I write a piece of program like this, uh, which has line number eight, I will never, I will never execute lines number 10 and 11. They'll never be executed because every time I come to line number eight, I jump, I branch, I branch, right? I'll branch. Very soon, I guess I'll show you an example of how you, you could use unconditional branching. I think when we look at procedures, right, just branch to an exit, exit, go to the exit, um, exit label every time you get to the end of like a label or something. Right. I'll show you just now. Yes? On, on the conditional branch? Well, the conditional, the unconditional or conditional? I think I'm going blind, I don't know what's happening. i sorry, deaf. No, seriously, I, I don't know what's happening here. I should probably go to the hospital. It could be serious, right? I'll be bad. My entire livelihood is centered around having eyes and ears here. Turn into a pulp or something. Now, so, that's, so the difference between, and I guess, best way of explaining, our question is, uh, what's the difference really between an unconditional branch and a conditional branch, right? The difference is that one of them must have a Boolean expression that we evaluate to either true or false. This is what we're saying here. Are these numbers the same? Are these numbers different? Is this number less than this number, for instance? Those are conditional branches, right? And you notice that for conditional branches, because you're comparing two different values, you must have things that you're going to compare against, which is why all these conditional branches have like two registers in this case then depending on what the, the Boolean expression evaluates to, because 
what you're doing here is you're checking this and this. The result will either be true or false here, right? Is this equal to this? True. Is this equal to this? False, right? That's why I'm saying it's a Boolean expression. Um, but for unconditional branching, what you're saying is there's no associated condition. You just go to the label, you just branch to the label, which is why it's called unconditional, because there's no condition. Right, every time the CPU comes across that instruction, then it goes to the label that you specify. It's like, uh, in fact, what literature will tell you is that it's like the equivalent of go to. You're just telling the CPU, say, go to this address in memory, right? Just go to this address in memory. Yes? The, the, um, the the less than branch. Let me say you are inputting value, uh -huh. then in your main, you put in options for so so that the console should print. If the value is equal to, it just branches off to the equal to value. If it's not equal to, it branches off to the instruction that's going to tell us that the branch is not equal to. And if it's less than, it just branches off to the instruction that's going to tell us it's less than. Is that possible? It is. It is possible, but you see, be, because, that's a, an excellent question, by the way. Uh, you will have fun next year. I, I wish I was going to be around teaching you that course. But you will have fun next year with this. I promise you, this is what you're going to be doing. In a high-level programming language, to implement what she's saying, you have what they call, and I, I don't know if you've done now this in Excel, you implement what they call an if, else, if, else, Statement. So if you are checking against the numbers, you'd say, if they're equal, then you'd execute what is in here. Else, if the number is not equal in here. Otherwise, if none of the conditions are, are satisfied, you execute what is in else. So what you should do in MIPS, what you do in MIPS, because you're, you're looking at what the machine does. The machine translates this down to the lowest level, right? So what the machine would do is, well, have separate instructions for this. So what you're saying is you need to have B N E, B E Q, uh, B G T, perhaps, I guess B L T. So if you're checking against the numbers, you check. Um, if a number, if, if a number is equal to 22, you will go to X, well, A, B, C, D. So to implement what you're saying, you'd have to come up with these instructions where you say, a user enters a number, let's say it's one, you will check, is one, is one not equal to, well, I guess it's a wait, not equal to 22, then you immediately branch and go to A. But if the user enters uh, 22, you notice here that uh, you check, is 22 not equal to 22? No, so this will not, this will not be executed, you can't jump to A. You come here, is 22 equal to 22? It works, right? And then you jump to B, for instance. So to answer your question, you would have to come up with separate instructions that are aimed at achieving what it is you want to do, depending on what condition is satisfied. Yes? Which is much harder, right? This is why we need to abstract what the machine does. This is far much easier than this. Far much easier, right? This is logic. Yes, sir? So, uh, when, uh, first question is, can you implement an if statement? Yes. So, you, you can because what the machine does is, uh, the, the machine, the machine converts what you would have in a high level programming language. So if you have an if else, if else uh, code block, what the machine will do is it will convert this into equivalent um, assembly language instructions. So yes, you can. So to come up with an if statement in assembly, you have to write that the if statement. Yeah, so, so these things here. All the four have to be in the Well, it's not all the four, obviously. You notice, <laughs> you notice that uh, some of these things are redundant, right? Oh, this is false, I guess. Some of these things will probably never be executed. 
uh, unless if you order these things in the correct way. Do you understand this? Like if I, if I, if I put B and Q here and B, Q, there's never going to be a point in time when BGT and B, uh, B, LT are going to be executed. Do you understand this? Why? Because whatever number you enter, it will either be equal to or less than, or not equal to. So these two will never be executed, do you understand? Think about whatever number, think about any number here, one here. One is not equal to 22, so you branch to A. 22, 22 is equal to, 22 is equal to 22, so you branch to B. 100, 100 is not equal to 22, so you branch to A. You will never execute these things, right? You always be jumping to A and B. So, you, so for you to implement an if else statement, you have to really think long and hard about how you're going to properly order these, these different uh, instructions here. Do you understand this? And like I said, I mean, if you look at the equivalent, uh, the equivalent bare instructions for BGT here, you realize that really behind the scenes, you're just using B, B, Q, and B, and Q. Yes? So choosing is dependent on what you're trying to accomplish. Everything you do in, whenever you're writing Excel formulas is dependent on the logic. What are you trying to accomplish? So whether or not you're going to use BN, BNE or BGT will depend on what the problem is you're trying to solve. If you're, if you're trying to find out if someone is broke, you, you obviously use BGT and BOT. There has to be a threshold for knowing whether someone is broke or something. Okay. Um, sorry? Yeah, you have a threshold. How do you define someone being broke? Not having money. Or maybe not having, having less than 20 quarts or something, or 50 quarts, right? So you come up with a condition. B, B, BLT 20. Branch to broke. BGT 20. Branch to not broke, right? Do you understand this? Like, and, and here's the thing, here's the other thing. What if, what if someone enters 20, if they have 20 itself, you'd have to decide to say, or well, maybe broke is less than 20, greater or equal to 20 is not broke. So what you need to have is three separate instructions. BLT for broke, BGT for not broke, B E Q for not broke. I'm trying to make sure people understand. If you maybe the the broke thing is a bad example. Okay, fine. So if we are saying we we, we are coming up with a simple with simple instructions to determine whether or not someone is broke, and our threshold is 50 quarter. And we are saying if someone if, if, if someone has less than 50 quarter, broke, right? Greater than 50 quarter, not broke, right? Not broke. Um, I don't know if this uh, is paying for broke here, but, but the question is, you notice that if you use BLT and BGT and you, you write your program, you notice that 50 is not taken into account. 50 B L T 50. What do you think that is? Is 50 less than 50? Is 50 greater than 50? What I'm trying to say is if you come up with an implementation of broke, not broke, and you just use these two conditions, 50 will never be taken into account. So the way you take into account 50 is you probably need to have equal to 50 which is, we say this is not broke as well, because we're saying not broke is more than, is 50 and above. So meaning that you need B, L, T, B, G, T, and B, E, Q. It's, it's just logic, you have to think about what, what it is you're trying to accomplish 
and how you go about accomplishing it really. Okay, so I mean just showing us how these things work and to, day after tomorrow we shall go in the lab and do these things hands on, which would be nice. We have plenty of exa examples, right? Yeah. Okay, you're on then. Again, it's logic. What he's asking is, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. What he's asking is, if, if you want to come up with, let's say, uh, instructions that, that make use of, uh, let's say, all these four. Your question is, should they all be in one label, the instructions? They must. Well, it depends on the logic. They must, though. They should. Be because what you're doing is, for, for you, to, for, for you, to, to, for you to, to decide to come up with these instructions, you must already have values that you're going to compare against, right? So if you, are, if, you are, if you have the values defined in main, then all these four instructions must be in main. And then from main, this is where you're jumping to a desired label, right? So it could be A depending on whether this is not equal, B. But, but obviously, you would have to have separate labels here, A, B, C, D, with, with different instructions associated with them. Now, listen, I mean, this is uh, not that hard. Uh, 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 what makes it easy is because it's all logic, right? So, I mean, examples of B, I'm just showing, showcasing examples of how you go about using these instructions, so BQ here, uh, BN, this was supposed to be BNQ here, branch if not equal. Same drill, right? Whenever you have a conditional branch, it means you're comparing values. You have a Boolean expression that results in true or false. So you must have two input values that you're comparing against, and you must have a label where you're going to branch to, depending on whether that particular condition evaluates to true or is satisfied. Because the condition for conditional branches, the condition can only be true or false. Nothing else, it's true or false. Which is, uh, which is why, by the way, I'm guessing you're thinking now, true or false, one or zero. Right? Yes. And the branch label. Yeah. Can you use maybe a different <coughs> label or something. Yeah, yeah. So his, his question is, this is good stuff. His question is, can you use, uh, this is defined by the person writing code. So if you are the one writing these instructions, you get to decide what name you want to give this. This could have been X, this could have been Y, this could have been your name. But it's always advisable that you use things that make sense, right? When you're writing these things, because somebody else is probably going to read what you're writing. You might want to refer to this. So you, you don't want to, you know, a couple of weeks from now thinking, why did I give this label the name X? Right? But if, if you gave it the name, oh, branch, lab, and branch label is not even good here. But if you are working on a block, not block, this would be like, not, not, not broke or something. Right. Okay. I mean, you notice it's, a, it's the the thing here is you just need to kind of remember how you you use the condition and condition and unconditional branches. Um, again, if there's a question that comes through, there will be a table with instructions, right, and what they do. So you have to do is think about how you you go about using the instructions, really. And the other key thing here, what we spoke about here. Um, uh, again, I mean, this is trivial stuff. You notice even though this is the pseudo instruction, again, takes in two variables and then you're branching. But, but the, the only difference from this pseudo instruction from the core, um, the, the bare instructions we're talking about here is you're doing much more than just checking if a value is not equal to. Right? You're checking against a number to see if, uh, if it is actually less than that particular uh, or another number that you want to compare against. Here's a question for you. Uh, something to think about here. If you are not, if you are not going to use, um, if there was no pseudo instruction called BLT, 
How would you implement this? There's no, there's, assuming there's no, there's no, there's no pseudo instruction called BOT. How would you implement this using B, B and E and B Q? These things, right, conditions are best, uh, are best done by thinking about, uh, you have like some hypothetical number that you're thinking about and the number that you're comparing against. You notice that you can actually implement this. You're just trying to check if a number is, is, is less than a particular given number. How do you choose that? Hey, think about that, I don't know. Yeah, we don't know, nobody knows, right? Um, yeah, so this is just, uh, I guess, screenshots of examples of how you go about doing this. But again, I guess trying to showcase the fact that uh, this so-called uh, branch, branch if, uh, if uh, what is the branch if less than, right? Branch if less than is a pseudo instruction. It's just trying to showcase the pseudo instruction, which is why you have a, uh, um, is this shift if, what, what is this? Is this shift if less than or something? And then BN. E, I don't know, we'd have to check the manual for what SLT stands for, forgotten. But bottom line here is that because it's pseudo-instruction, you have it translated into this and that, right? Uh, again, BGT and, no difference here between BLT and BGT. The difference is in the logic and what happens depending on what values you're comparing against. Um, Yeah, again, just showcasing uh, what happens to the pseudo instruction BGT here. Something to, I guess, think about here uh, as we are transitioning to loops, I guess, is uh, how you'd go about doing this, right? Let's say you, you are uh, wanting to write a program that prompts a user for an input score, and then it classifies it as either a pass or a fail. How do you get to use uh, conditional and conditional branches to accomplish this? I don't know. Right? Something to think about, I guess, I don't know. Uh, what, if, what if we wanted to do much more, right? Not just pass or fail, but we want to figure out if the value is an A, B plus, B, C plus, C, D plus, or D. How do we do that? Same question as here, but you will probably be getting the same value, but what you're doing is you're doing much more than just saying pass or fail. You're telling the user, specific grade that they've gotten. What the hell is this? this is are, are, we, are, we, are we following? Can we already think about how we would implement the C, C plus, D, D plus? Yes. Yes, Mr. Kevin, sir. What's the question? When you use the special in, for example, PGT, then I say the first register is fail because that's why the second register is fail because they are user. And I say so what does it mean for there? Is it saying value is T zero greater than the value is T? Well what you're doing with BGT is um you're, ch you're checking if the first value is greater than the second. For BOT, if, if the, the value in the first register is less than the value in the second register, the order they appear. His question is, if you have, uh, if you have something like BGT here, eight, nine, what we're saying is, you're checking if is the value in here greater than the value in here. BGT 8,9. BLT 8,9. Uh, it's pretty trivial, really. Is 8 less than 9? If it is branch, which is why we're saying uh, BLT 8,9. BGT 
is the value in 8 greater than the value in 9? If it is branch, branch if greater than what is in 8 and what is in 9? Branch if equal to BEQ, what is in 8, comma, what is in 9? Is this making sense, guys? Think about this, this is nice, right? I don't know. What would you do here? But it's true, you notice that, uh, sorry? How would it be complex? This one, most of them, we are using the if function that exists. Yeah. Have specific values in yes. the range. Mm -hmm. When you specify the range of an A plus, yes. you say if if x is greater than or equal to 90 yes. A plus, comma, you you put in you get to insert all the values that are going to give you an A plus, an A, a B plus, a B, yes. till you reach the D. That's when you are going to close the function. Yes. That's, that's how it's applied in Excel. Maybe you can... Yeah, so the question though is, uh, I like the fact that you are linking it to Excel because we understand how this works in Excel. So the question is, if we understand how this works in Excel, which is what I do here, by the way, look at this. This is Excel, right? This is what Ms. Mlenga is saying here. Ifs, ifs are everywhere, right? In fact, in Excel here, what I was doing in, what I'm doing with this formula is I'm just implementing if else. But because there's no else, I, 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 I just use nested ifs here to compute if a value is, is an A plus, right? So I'm, I'm just saying, I'm checking. Oh, is this value greater or equal to 90? If it's greater than or equal to 90, there's going to be an A plus. If it is not greater than or equal to 90, then what I need to do is implement an else. Else I will check, is this value greater or equal to 80? So, well, you have to think about, about this from this perspective, right? The fact that there's a systematic, there's, a, there's an order you have to follow for you to check if a value is, is greater or equal to 90. If it is not greater or equal to 90, you do the next thing, you check the next thing. What I'm saying is for you to implement this in MIPS, why not just check? You first of all have a first, um, a first condition, conditional branch that says branch if, branch if, if, you should be, you should be happy you, you chose this course because uh, you, you'll be a logical person by the time you leave this, I assure you. Um, should, you should speak to people that have done these funny courses like this. Oh, uh, you notice that they think differently, and, and it's good to think. I'm not saying the other people don't, uh, the thinking is not good, but it's good to have uh, different ways of approaching problems. What I'm saying is, if we're saying an A plus is, if, if we say an A plus is 90, greater or equal to 90, what MIPS instruction would we have to use for us to implement this? Sorry? B? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, but so you, you understand what we're seeing here, what we're saying. For you to implement an A plus, you'd have to have BEQ and BGT. BQ, BEQ, whatever, let's say we, we're gonna put this in eight or, or something. And then we'll, we'll, we'll put uh, 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 the, the value, hard coded value, 90, uh, well, I'd call it value, I'd call it value 19 in nine, and then this would be input from a user, right? This could be anything, this could be like 80, you got 80%, you got 50% or something. So what you're doing is you're going to check here, uh, is what the user has gotten uh, equal to 90, right? If it is, then A plus. Yes. Yes. So what we yes. So what we're doing here is actually it's it's an if statement. We're saying if the value is greater or equal to ninety, pass. This is what you do in a high-level programming language. Actually, it's it's all 
it's so easy to use that you don't have to have separate instructions. Right, I mean Excel is a bad example. If I was using Python, I would just write a simple statement that says, if the value is less or equal to, if, if let's say A is great, sorry, greater or equal to 90, then do something here. Else if, if the value A is greater or equal to 80, do something here. And then I have like multiple if statements corresponding to the different conditions that I have. Because it turns out that I have uh, conditions for A plus, conditions for A, conditions for B plus, conditions for B, right? So in MIPS though, going back to our MIPS example, in MIPS what we have to do to implement the A plus is check first if the value entered is equal to 90 and also check if the value that has been entered is, is greater than 90. This would be your first condition. You know that, you know that for, for a person that has gotten, if this was a test, so anyone who has gotten 90 up to 100, the condition would be satisfied. So they will, they will branch to A plus. For, for A, you have another B if equal to, you check in 8 as well, and then you just say A here. You're just checking if, if uh, but, but you'd, you'd need a separate, um, a separate value that you're checking against here. And in fact, if I, were, if I were the one writing this, I would just overwrite what is in nine somewhere here and just say, what is in nine equated to 80? But the input still remains the same. So that when you get here, you'll be checking the input. If a person has entered, uh, let's say, 88, for instance, you come here is 88 equal to 90? No. Is 88 greater than 90? No. So this won't be executed. You come here, you know that the value, the person's value does not fall within this threshold, within this range, so what you do is you say, I want to check the next condition, which is like an A. So an A threshold is 80, is it? Don't know, 80. So you come here, you overwrite this and you say BQ, the same input value against 80, BGT, the same input value against, against 80. So, I guess 89 or 88. Think here, 88 failed here, you come here, you, you say put 80 here, you, you check. Is 88 equal to 80? Is 88 greater than 80? So we know it's an A. So you, you do this, it's a, the thing here, what I'm trying to say is that for you to implement this, you need two conditional, um, conditional branches for each of these A, A, A plus A, C plus C, D plus D, two of them. Yes, two conditional branches, the BEQ and BGT. Now here's the thing, the, the people that are, the, the people that are thinking here, I'm guessing, how would we do this if we wanted to start checking the conditions from the smallest? If you can use BGT, you can use BLT. If you decide to use BLT, you notice that you'd have to start with the smallest range. So you come to like, uh, I don't know, D, 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 right? D is like, uh, it's between zero and no, between 0 and 39, is it? I don't know, but you can think about it. Let's say it's 0 and 39. What you do is, you check, is, um, and in fact, BOT might be interesting. If you, if you start with BOT, maybe you can just uh, use less than 39 or less than 40. So you don't have to have two, you understand this? If you start with the smallest ones, you'd say, you'd say, BOT, BOT, uh, BLT 40, BLT, BLT 45, BLT, think about this for a second. If you get five, you will come here. Is five less than 40? 
branch to D. If you get uh, 41, is 41 less than 40? Is 41 less than 45? So you branch here. So what I'm trying to say is if, depending on what order of, you see, what you're doing here is to implement the logic is you're just thinking about the correct order that you're going to follow, right? And it turns out here that if you use this, you don't, you don't need two unconditional branches, just one. Ah, you could probably just need one as well for this one, right? I thought people would say that, don't know. What if you just say BGT, the threshold is 91, not 90. Is, 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 let's say the input is um, 90. Is 90, uh, no, no, not 91, sorry, 89. Logical error, right? 89, is 90 greater than 89? So, A plus. Just, just guys, just logic. Now on Wednesday we shall do some really nice examples to try and, uh, sad we have to do this because the test has this, so. Uh, are there any questions? I will stick around for those that, <laughs> I don't know if I. Uh, are you busy or something? Sorry? You're liars. You always. Hey, uh, so we'll continue with loops and then we're almost there. I'm glad that we're on, on track. We're almost there. This would have been less painful if we had done formulas in Excel and. But. Uh, no, the problem is we'll just lengthen the, the amount of. There's still a lot we need to cover, so. In fact, the, pl the initial plan was to see if we could have like some crash course introduction for people not aware of, or people not familiar with programming. But we don't have time, right? We'd, we'd have... Uh... <laughs> that would be a good one. I... Yeah, I think... It... No, there would be no sex thing. <laughs> we probably have five people in one room answering the same question. But... It would be, it would be, proud. I think we'll turn it into a practical one. Don't you think so? That would be nice. There's no such thing. The rules don't allow that. <laughs> Sorry? What do you mean other questions? It will be practical. Thank you for telling us. <laughs> Yeah, hi. I'm good, thank you. Yeah, I just want to know when, like, after what type of instructions do you issue a system? Like, do you issue a system anyhow? No. You issue a Cisco if you're looking for an operating service that you want to make use of. Print something, exit a program. Yeah. This is when you issue a Cisco because a Cisco is just a signal to to the computer, in this case, QT screen, to say, tell the kernel that I'm interested in this service, I want to use this service. Yeah. Okay, now, let's say I put the user to input a number. Yeah. And then, that number, let's say, uh, yeah, it's uh, the same register, B0, for printing an integer, that's what. Oh, uh, no. Oh, one. Ah, oh, yeah. Well, I'm reading a screen. Okay. So, like, it's not four. four. It's eight. Eight. Let's say I'm, I'm asking a user to, like, let's say, uh, write a number, enter a number. That same one is in the B0 register. Yeah. The same string. It's not uh, a string, it's saying a number. There are two things there. Mm -hmm. There's a string, then there's a number. Yeah, but let's, let's, let's put the board here. We try to write this code here. No, not the board. Let's do it here. Yeah, so you're saying? Let's say write that. Right, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, we're writing like that. Yeah, the actual code. Yeah. So, no, no, we have that. Okay. Yeah, message one. Semicolon. Yeah, semicolon. Full colon. Yeah, full colon. Okay. Like, uh, ask me. Mm -hmm. 
Enter a number. Then we'll go on text. Then. Yeah, we'll go on text. So we want to print this. Okay. Like, uh, yeah. Then when the user enters the what? This message goes into this one. So, no. That's not going to this register. Argument register. You see, what you're doing is you're load. You're saying load. There's not nothing going in your register. You're just saying load the address of this data, this piece of text, which is data and memory. Load the address into this register. What you're loading is the address. You cannot load the entire thing into a register. Why? Register is 32 bits, right? How long is this going to be? How long is this message? How many bits is this? Eight, 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 eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Sixteen times eight. What is sixteen times eight? Can't fit, right? Won't happen. Can, won't happen, right? Doesn't work like that. How many did we count? Sixteen times eight. Can't fit. Yeah. So what you're loading is the address. In so, fact, it's a beginning address of this data. Yeah. So now, here, uh, it, will, it will show on the console. Yeah. But now the user will enter like one. Okay. Yeah. So it, this is the same address we use for printing mm -hmm. and intake. So yes. Do I have to get this mess, the address out first before I put an integer there? No, you don't have to. Because you see, we said this, and, and the reason why we started our discussion of cache, registers, CPU, fetch decode cycle is we wanted to understand what we're doing. Registers are temporal memory locations. Yeah. You don't have to remove what is in the register, you just overwrite what is in there. So the, the, when, how do you print an integer? Uh, S, uh, yeah. One. Mm -hmm. and, uh, like we get the load. No, not Cisco, but we, we load. load. What do you want to load? Load the... Uh, Cisco. 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 Lord Cisco. You can't. No, no. It's, just, it's just Cisco. Why? Okay, for, why are for we printing an integer? Why are we calling Cisco here, guys? For printing an. Are you, are you, are you crazy or something? Listen. <laughs> Sir, printing an. Uh, if you're printing an integer, right? Uh, you load. You the question you should ask yourself is, what do you want to print? If you're printing yeah. an integer, what are you printing? So I have to. Now, we have to put now. The, uh, Here's the thing here. Is there anything, excuse me, is there anything syntactically wrong with what you've done here? <laughs> is there something wrong with what we've done? Yeah. Is there anything syntactically wrong with what we've done here? I have to put first the number. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I know, but is there anything? Look at what happens here, right? There's nothing syntactically wrong. What are you going to print? Nothing. What will we? What will be printed? Just the, the message. Mm. What is loaded in A0 in number 8? Address of the thing is what you print. Observe. If you print this, you see this number here? Yeah. This number here is the address. Of the same me message you're printing. <laughs> Look at this. What you said here, right, is you're saying you, you're saying you want a user to enter a number, right? Yeah. And then here you want to print. Yeah. But because because system call one prints an integer, you must specify what you want to print. How do you specify? You specify what you print by putting the value you want to print into A0. But because you've not specified what you want to print and, it, and A0 has a value, what is the value of A0? The register, or I mean the address of this yeah. string. So what you're printing here is the, the address. The message. This, this value here, 26, is the address yeah. in memory. Do you understand this? Yeah. 
So we have to override the message, the address. Yes, yeah, so you have to specify what you wish to print, right? Yeah. How do you specify what you wish to print? Move to A0, the value that you wish to print. So maybe at some stage, maybe you had a load into 8, the value 5. And then you'd move to A0, what? What is in 8? And then you'll print 5 here. And you load, you execute this. Do you understand this? You see this? Is this making sense? What was your question? Okay. So now this, this is just you. Uh, you have included it. It's not getting like user what? Uh, input. Okay, so yeah. you want user input? Yeah. Okay. I want to get user input. What input do you want to get? We, we want to get an index. Okay. Yeah. So how do we do that? We load. Uh, we, yeah, load immediately. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Fine. Uh huh. Then we. Move. What is this This one. First, when we have to read the index before we. This is what we're doing in line number eleven and twelve. 11, yeah. Yeah. Then we. We want to print that. Yeah, I want to print using system. That's one. Huh? So we are here. Yeah, okay. So if we want to print what the user has, has entered, what the user is going to enter, where, what are we going to move to A0 then? The address of the yeah. integer. Mm. No. Why would you want to move the address of the integer? OK. We have to put the register, which is containing the integer. Which, which is? Which is uh, V0. OK. To the argument register A0. Yeah, which is what we've done. Yeah. So if you run this, you're going to print. <laughs> Are we going to graduate in 2022? Right? Something wrong here. We are printing one again. What have we done wrong? We're not printing. We're not printing. Um... <laughs> saying in visual there's one. <laughs> we're not. We're not <laughs> Do you know why there's one? There? <laughs> This move here should have been here. Do you know why there was one? Yeah, this it's the value it's of one. one. Sequential, right? Yeah. This makes sense now, does it? Yeah. I'm deliberately doing this because I'm trying to showcase to you the importance of using temporal registers and not any other funny things you use, right? When you're moving things from special purpose registers, registers that do special things, use temporal registers. So in line number 14, instead of what I did, what I should have done is I should have said here, I should have, I should have said move into register 8, what is in V0. And then here, I should have said move, what is in 8, that it doesn't, I'm just saying it's just, Get into the habit of using temporal registers for whatever computations you're using. Is this making sense now? Yeah. Is that more your question? No. Your question is when do we use this cause? Do you understand why we use this? Because yeah, I was having some problems. What problems? Find that instead of putting, maybe you put this instruction before this instruction. Don't. Yeah. Follow the rules, right? This is sequential. And no, you no, notice no, but that. But there are no rules. There are rules. We're learning about the rules. This yeah, is done sequential. What are you talking about? But like, you know, like a reference, like you use move <laughs> before you use load immediate. No, but it says well, some some rules are implicit. It's logic, right? Like like what happened when we printed one instead of the value we wanted to print, because we moved into a zero. What was in v zero and what was in v zero was one. If we had followed the rules, the recommendation of using temporary registers would have avoided the error, the logical error. Is this making sense? Yeah. Are there any other questions? Is this uh, nice, right? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Why? What is in? Why are we doing this? Yeah. This. Why? Why are we? Why are we spent a lot of time on this lecture series? Why? To understand how computation is. So, but how does this help us understand how calculations are performed?
Yes. yes. I do hope when, when people ask, ask you these questions, like, what are you doing? And you say, oh, we're using, we're using MIPS. And someone asks you, why, why are you doing that MIPS, right? You should be able to answer, like she did. Explain why you're doing this. You are, I mean, you want to be in a position where you'll be able to explain to other people how a computer works. And by now, you, you understand what's happening here. Oh, there's RAM, there's all these things. This black box, right? Von Neumann architecture, all core components. What happens in the core components? CPU, blah, 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 blah. When you go into the CPU, software, software is loaded into RAM, into RAM. Individual instructions are executed, how are those individual instructions are executed, and converted to a machine equivalent, right? Ones and zeros. Oh, but you can't understand ones and zeros, so we dump them down to assembly. It turns out that there's no other way of having a direct translation of those 32 bits, ones and zeros, other than going to assembly. You can convert those 32 streams of ones and zeros into an instruction. Add I, B, I mean B, B and Q, for instance. Well, this is a system goal. The next step is understanding how those ones and zeros are going to be translated by the CPU, the different components. Yeah. Just to be empty. Yeah. Why are you doing this? We don't know. Like, we don't want characters saying, it's like calculus. This guy was just like, why did I learn calculus? There was no point. Well, there was, right? Sorry? Sorry? Why are we doing calculus? <laughs> We're not doing calculus, right? I, I assure you, this would have been much more interesting, I, I think, if, if, um, if there was programming before this, I guess. Yeah, yeah. about this one. Also. What about this one? Why is this instruction uh, having like, why is it in, in between two system calls? Which instruction? Okay, okay this system calls for this one, uh -huh. and this system calls for this one. Yeah. So, but why are you giving this instruction a system call? So, what thing I, oh, it's used for reading and, and reading. Yeah. Yeah, but why are you not putting it together with the other instruction? Which one? But we don't, we don't have to. Because, because of the rules. The rules say for system call number five, once you specify that you're interested in system core number five, you just issue Cisco. Okay. Just like you do when you issue, when you use system core, system core number 10. The moment the CPU sees, oh, this is in visual there's five and it's issued Cisco, it knows that it must ask the user for input. And in the case of Blink, you type in the input. That input though is going to end up in V0. Before you do other things that are going to override what is in V0, move what the user has entered into a temporary register. No, sir, just a minute. Here, I'm confused. So we have moved everything that is in, in here, in this register, not so. Mm -hmm. Now, when printing out the integer, yeah. so meaning this one is empty, not so. It's not empty. They're still f at this point. Mm. You see, move, move copies. You're getting a copy. OK. Observe. Um, I will. I will say, load into eight the value five, and then move into nine. What is in eight? I want to do that again. If I load and execute them, our program here. Register status for nine and ten, nine, eight, and nine. Nothing. Right? Run that. What is in eight and five? And, and nine? Five. Five. What you've done with the move operation is you get a copy of what is in that register and put it in the desired register. So what that means when you issue the move is the copy that was previous in there will still be in there. Okay. Okay. Right? That's what move does. Now, and I know, oh, but move. It's not the move in English where you're saying when you're moving, I'm moving to the new race. It's not like, you know, yeah, yeah. it's like, you know, understand what I mean? Yeah. Maybe it should have been copy or something. So, but this instruction now overrides what's in here. Yes. Okay. Because moving would, have, would, would be counterproductive. If you, were, if you wanted to, to move something out of there, it's like you're, you'd, be, you'd need an operation to delete what was in the register. But there's no point in deleting because it's just like overwriting. It's, it's like, think about this for a second, a file, right? You create a file and then you write contents in your file. If you're trying to put additional content in that file, what you can do is you can choose to open that file, delete that file, save it, and then start overwriting it. Or alternatively, 
You can just say, open a new file, write something, and then just do a save, and then select that file that you want to overwrite. Which one is faster? So can like, you say this instruction, like we, we remove this instruction, then we put add, then here we include register zero. Yeah, that's can the, it, it, well, I don't know, can it? It's fine. Yeah, it's it can. There's different ways of, uh, where are you going, Wupe? There's different ways of, uh, see you. There's different ways of doing this. This can work. You're doing the same thing. It's, it's like there's a value in here, but what you're saying is, for you to get a value in here, add zero to what is in V0. What are you going to get? The same, the same value. value. And then put the result in A. Works. Now, for some of these things, I do encourage you guys to actually... Are there people that are going to graduate in 2023? I want you guys to... Works, that's fine. You want to try this out instead of asking hypothetical questions, right? For you to understand what's going on, you want to try these things that you're asking instead of what happens here. Try them out. Yeah, we've been trying, sir. We've been trying. Okay. Yeah, we're always Try harder. Lab, yeah. Try harder. But you find that at times you go to the lab, then the officer in charge is not there, is not opening. Go sir. to the lab sir. when... Sir, the reason why we're asking is sometimes we go to the lab, then we come up with questions. Why is this happening? So these are the questions that we ask. Ah. Not that we don't go there, but after trying to work things out, there are questions that usually pops up. Then we try now to ask for you. This, this security guard question you just raised is very important to me. Um, <clears throat> you do know that there's a timetable that's publicly available. Why, why don't you check that timetable for slots? Where are you? Um, do you do that? Yeah. It's even available on the group. Yeah, so do you, do you actually go there when, when you're supposed to go there? Yeah. Please tell me when, when next you're going to go there and this thing will not be... We usually follow him when we, when we go there. We He's supposed to be there. So, like today, for instance, oh, I guess today is a bad day. We can create a slot here. Like tomorrow, for instance, that place is supposed to be open from 7. For you guys, it's available from 7 up to... Why is this happening? It's supposed to be all over here, from 7 up to 12, actually. You have access to the lab, right? On Wednesday, from 7 up to 13. The lab is available. Some much bigger slot on Sunday also. Is it, all, is it available on Sunday? Has yeah, anyone checked on Sunday? It's only on... It's like for three hours, yeah. Oh, so, but I asked you. We want you some know? more slots. Yeah, like, but I, I asked you, know, you know why I created Wish? It's gone. <laughs> Once more time. The reason, why, the reason why I included Sundays, right? Yeah. The, the, the people, right? Millennials always come up with excuses. Oh, um, I don't have a computer. So fine, there's a lab, right? We've created slots. This, this slot was meant for people that were claiming they didn't have computers. So, that lab is there, it's, the, it's, it's hardly ever used most of the time. So we created these slots, but I wasn't sure that people were going there on Saturdays, oh. on Sundays. So we can easily ask them to create, I mean, additional yeah. time on Sundays. Yeah, that would be nice. Okay. okay. How many go there on Sunday? How many? Problem is you want to go partying on Sundays instead of church, you know, but <laughs> yeah, this is, well, you're supposed to study. The exam is coming on the 20th of we November. Hey, I need party, to. Balancing. No. It's a, if I were you, in first year, you want to understand what's going on.